Hi everybody, it's Alan Robson again in another podcast of the Grizzly Tale. And tonight we're starting with something, well, I thought we'd start in gross fashion because we tend to go completely over the top in one direction or another, so we thought might as well start early. World records. Hmm. How can this possibly be gross? Well, world eating records. There are some, they do exist, and have a look to what they are. There's a world record for eating cooked dog. Now look at your little dog right now. He's probably going, looking up at you. Three and a half pounds of cooked dog eaten in 18 minutes, 10 seconds. There's also a world record for eating slugs. Now they're a bit hard to go down because they fight to come back up again. 12 slugs in two minutes. Sounds so doable. But I ate some slugs when I was off on the Yorkshire Moors with the Parachute Regiment. And it's not a wise idea, even if you cook them. There's a world record for eating 28 cockroaches in four minutes. 60 earthworms in three minutes, six seconds. 100 live maggots in five minutes, 29 seconds. Two pounds of eels in 32 seconds. They will slip right down. 144 snails in 11 minutes, 30 seconds. 12 bananas, including the skin, in 4 minutes, 14 seconds. 4 pound, 13 ounces of baked beans in 10 minutes, eating them one bean at a time. 24 hot dogs in 12 minutes. 13 raw eggs, 13 in 1.4 seconds. And 15 bowls of noodle soup, 100 pieces of sushi, 5 plates of wheat noodles, 5 plates of beef with rice, and 5 plates of curry and rice in 2 hours. That was the Japanese National Eating Championship. And also, some foods, you could argue, have killed people. Again, it doesn't sound likely. However, listen to this. Robert Greene was an English dramatist and he died when he ate too much Rhenish wine and too many pickled herring at a gala luncheon. The British Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger, his last words were, hmm, I think I could just eat another one of them Bellinis veal pies. King Henry I died because he ate a surfeit of lampreys. The lampreys are vampiric eels. King George I died of an overdose of melon. Robert Maxwell drowned after eating two bananas. Now, in a lot of old-fashioned mythical stories, Robin Hood fought against King John, wanting Richard back on the throne, and Robin Hood couldn't get him, but King John dropped dead at an abbey in East Anglia after gorging on peaches and cider. Elvis Presley was found dead in his toilet after he had just eaten a fried banana and peanut butter sandwich. And Buddha died at the age of 80, 483 years BC, from a hemorrhage of his intestines after he ate a curry that was far too hot for him. Now that's food for thought if you are thinking of trying a fowl. And oh, I'm not finished yet. Let's look at death that had food at the very root of it. And once again, it just sounds downright peculiar, but all of the following are true. The biggest ever case of food poisoning to come from any single source happened in Spain back in the early 1980s. Ramon and Elias Ferraro and 36 other executives from their company were jailed for a combined total of 6,000 years when 600 of their customers died 
after eating contaminated cooking oil. Now, if you've been lucky enough to have visited Brazil during the Great Carnival, you may well have heard of a man called Rinaldo di Cavallo. He's known as the Fat King of Rio de Janeiro's Carnival Celebration, and he used to appear at the carnival every year. Huge chap. Well, he actually died trying to lose weight. He entered a weight loss clinic in Rio and he dropped dead after losing 66 pounds in 30 days. So if you're on a diet, slow is good. Not stopping there though, because back in the early 90s, 15 mourners at a funeral at Nasuka in Nigeria died after, at the wake, they all ate the deceased's dog. The Australian Paul Cook was a 21-year-old storeman and he lived in Sydney. He died one day after he decided to inject himself with his favourite spread, Vegemite. Tadua Tanak was the chef to the Japanese Emperor Hirohito during World War II. A high-profile job, as the meals he prepared were always subject to the royal ritual of food tasting. And this is a practice that continued right up to 1989. But during the war, every single scrap of Hirohito's food had to be tested under laboratory conditions for any signs of contamination. Then, the meal would be served on a sterile plate. Even the royal poo and we had to be chemically analyzed to make sure that there was no signs of food poisoning. Now, Tadoa Tanak's record was unblemished because Hirohito never once had cause for complaint about his food. But when the emperor died, what the chef didn't realize was that all of the emperor's staff had to commit suicide. He lost his bottle a bit, so a couple of the emperor's hitmen helped him out. Let's go to Italy, where a guy called Paolo Ginelli went on a holiday to Naples, and he visited the hotel restaurant to celebrate his 80th birthday. On his way out, the sign saying restaurant fell on his head and killed him. Now, there's not a bad word I can say about bacon. Yes, we know it's fatty. Yes, we know it puts on the pounds. But smell it and forgive it. That's just how it goes. But the English statesman, Francis Bacon, he died, technically, when he was in the middle of inventing frozen food. He was travelling in a coach on a freezing winter's day when it occurred to him that food could be preserved by freezing it. So what he did was, he stuffed a dead chicken full of snow. And while he was out stuffing it, he caught a chill and died. Now just to show you how careful you've got to be, you know we hear stories of people injecting cattle with steroids to bulk them up and then we end up eating the meat and we're affected by whatever chemicals they've put in the damn thing. Well, Abraham Lincoln's mam died after the family cow ate a batch of poisonous mushrooms. Then Mrs. Lincoln drank the milk and popped her clogs. And the last one, in the early 90s, a 47-year-old Japanese bakery worker was really down and depressed because his wife had left him. He decided he would end his own life in the factory where he worked. So one day, he threw himself into the giant dough mixture and was mixed into a thousand pieces. And yes, I realize the stories I've told you were gross, but Grizzly, <laughs> now it's time. Let's talk cannibals. Fritz Harman was a meat dealer just after World War I in Germany and was the most prolific homicidal cannibal of all time. In the 1920s, he was known as the Vampire of Hanover 
What he used to do was he would pick up young male refugees. After the war, there were thousands. And he'd pick them up at the local railway station and he'd say, look, I can give you an apartment and give you some food. He would take them back to where he lived. He would sexually assault them and kill them by biting out their throats. After selling their clothes and whatever valuables they had, he got rid of the bodies, what was left of them. Remember, he'd eaten all the flesh and he would throw the bones into the river Lane in Hanover. He sold their flesh as horse meat in an open market to the starving population of that German town and he ate what he couldn't sell. His activities continued for six years and only came to an end when some young boys fishing in the river found a whole load of human skulls. It was estimated that Harmon averaged two victims a week he was only ever charged and convicted with the murders of 27 young men aged between 13 and 20, although the police estimated the death toll somewhere between 600 and 1,000 in one single year. Harmon was beheaded in Hanover Prison on the 15th of April in 1925. Now, you may have heard the name Ed Gein. He was a bloke, just an ordinary middle-aged fella from Wisconsin in America. And yet, it was his story that inspired the film Psycho and later on Silence of the Lambs. Gein was a cannibal and also a necrophiliac. He began digging up female corpses to satisfy his lust and then graduated to murder because he couldn't find bodies fresh enough. Sometimes he was having sex with them and they would literally fall apart. A police raid on Gein's well-stocked fridge back in the late 50s helped account for 15 bodies. They discovered human skin bracelets, a drum skin made out of human skin, two lips on a string, four noses in a cup, and dozens of human organs as ornaments around their house. When the police were questioning him, he admitted that he really loved covering himself in the skin of all of his dead victims. Now, this is something you didn't know. We mentioned Robin Hood and the myth, because he didn't even come from Nottingham. But the myth was that he wanted to try and keep King Richard on the throne, Richard the Lionheart, Coeur de Lyon. Well, no, he didn't, because he didn't exist at that time, and he was from Yorkshire. However... Did you know that King Richard, the guy everybody liked, even though he wasn't even English, he was French. During the Third Crusade, when essentially they went to try and ethnically cleanse uh, everybody that happened to be Arabic, King Richard I dined on curried head of Saracen. Makes you think twice about snogging him. Then, of course, American grandfather Albert Fish, he went to the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison back in the middle 30s. After killing and eating at least 15 children, and Fish took pleasure writing to the mother of his final victim, a 10-year-old girl, six years after she'd vanished. Grace sat on my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind there and then to eat her. Louis Kaysberg was one of 87 men and women who decided they would go on a 2,000 mile trek west to California. Now, the expedition was led by a farmer, George Donner and his family, but it was very badly planned without even enough food to survive what was a particularly hard winter. Out of the original party of 87 men, only 47 made it to the end of the trail, and the only way they could survive was by eating their companions after they had died. Some of the survivors struck a less than penitent attitude about their, their awful dilemma. Kiesberg cheerfully confessed to a preference for human liver. He thought their innards were really good and if you added a lot of pepper, 
brain soup really slid down a treat. He paid tribute to George Donner's wife. Now remember, Donner was the leader of the expedition. He said, Tamsin, we loved Tamsin. In fact, she was the healthiest woman that I've ever eaten. Hard to believe, but they weren't prosecuted. In fact, Kiesberg became a very, very rich man later in life, and he opened a steakhouse. So let's pop across to the States again and go to Milwaukee. Jeffrey Dahmer went to trial in the early 90s for eating, killing and eating, 17 people. Police raided his apartment and found seven heads in the fridge, skulls in his filing cabinet, and a number of body parts in a kettle. And when they discovered a human heart in his deep freeze, the police looked at him and Dharma said, oh, that, I was saving it for later. US government officials staged a grand opening ceremony for their brand new Department of Agriculture staff canteen. And it was attended by a man called Robert Berglund, who was the agriculture secretary at the time. He unveiled a brass plaque, calling it the Alfred Packer Memorial Dining Facility. After one of America's more famous 19th century pioneers and frontiermen. However, two months later, the plaque was hurriedly removed when somebody remembered that Mr. Packer had been chiefly famous for being a cannibal, convicted of killing and eating five Colorado gold prospectors in the 1870s. The American killer cannibal John Weber was convicted for the murder of a 17-year-old girl from Wisconsin, a young schoolgirl. And during his trial, Weber confessed that he'd made a lovely patty from the girl's leg. During China's Cultural Revolution in the 60s and 70s, a number of Mao Zedong's Red Guard ate the flesh of their enemies to prove to their leader that they were fully class conscious. And also we can't mention that kind of state cannibalism unless we mention Uganda's former president Idi Amin. He was a member of the Kakua tribe who believed that if you killed a man and then ate a part of him, he wouldn't return to haunt the person who killed him. So in 1973, Armin ordered the assassination of his foreign minister, Michael Odanga. Now, before Odanga's body was dumped in the river for the crocodiles, in accordance with tribal ritual, Armin removed and then ate part of his liver. So there we've had a variety of odd and peculiar foodie things. So let's have a grisly tale or two. Now one of my great passions, of course, is history. I love looking back at what really happened and not just what everybody thinks really happened. Now if I asked you about Flora MacDonald, I guarantee that some of you would say, is she the woman that invented margarine? And others would say, oh, I've heard of the name somewhere. Wasn't she something to do with Bonnie Prince Charlie? Now, Flora MacDonald did save Bonnie Prince Charlie when he was trying to get out of the country after losing his final battle. But I'm going to tell you the whole story of Flora MacDonald, and I guarantee that the vast majority of you will be very surprised. It was in 1722, on little Milton Island of South Uist in the Outer Hebrides, that Flora MacDonald was born, the third and last child of Ranel MacDonald. Now, her parents were members of the gentry, her father a tax man and the leaseholder of both Milton and Balavanish. Sadly, her father passed not long after she was born in 1728, and she was brought up by the other members of the family. Her mother remarried a man called Hugh MacDonald of Armadale on Skye, and Flora didn't really get on well with her new stepfather, so chose to be raised by Sir Alexander MacDonald of Sleet. 
living a very safe and well-to-do existence. She chose not to go to Edinburgh for her education. Many think she did, but there's no proof of it. She's not named anywhere. Instead, she was home tutored and became an intelligent and quite sophisticated young lady of the islands. Many of the MacDonald clan were Catholic. However, this particular strand had all chosen to be Presbyterian. Now, purely by coincidence, Flora happened to be on Ben Becula in the Outer Hebrides in June 1746, when she bumped into a frightened Bonnie Prince Charlie. He and his immediate advisers had just escaped from the bloody defeat at Culloden, and he was well aware that the English were searching everywhere for him, particularly on the small islands off the west coast of Scotland. Surely it was only a matter of time before they would search all of the bigger ones. Now, young Flora and her family had not been involved in the rebellion, so there was no reason for her to involve herself. However, Captain Con O'Neill from County Antrim was the prince's protector and he was one of Flora's distant relatives. So Flora made contact with her stepfather, Hugh MacDonald, who was in charge of all of the paperwork, passes and permits to travel in and around the island. He warned her that if this was found out, she and her family could be executed. And this worried her, for it had been her decision and no other. Well, passes were generated for six men and two women. Bonnie Prince Charlie was dressed as an Irish maid called Betty Burke. Although the prince was rather foppish, he made an unlikely woman. The boat's crew, including O'Neill, headed out, landing on Skye, near Sir Alexander's house at Munkstadt, near Kirkbride. Now, the laird was not at home, but his wife, Lady Margaret, took charge and provided safe and plush accommodation to the whole party. Now, the bulk of the work was given to the island's steward, MacDonald of Kingsborough, whose first job was to get the prince back into male clothing. It was in his view that he looked a lot more conspicuous dressed as a maid. So the following day, Charles was taken to the rather more wild area around Portree on Rasse. They had plenty of food, warm accommodation in a crofter's cottage, and they could be easily reached by their contacts in France. Flora had waved them off, and she would never see any of them again. She'd only been in his company for about 40 minutes. But this would not be the end of it, barely the beginning. Around a fortnight later, the local boatmen were arrested. Four owners of taverns were hanged, and their inns burnt to the ground for helping the prince. Flora MacDonald and MacDonald of Kingsborough were arrested too and taken off to the Tower of London. Now, the original story had been that wealthy men of power and influence passed through the islands regularly and she claimed that they both had no idea this was Bonnie Prince Charlie. Flora said that she had merely guided some wealthy Scots towards the islands that they wanted to see, but it cut no cloth with the English so she was hurled into the Tower of London. Now, at that time, there were no women held there, just men, and nothing was ever written about whether she was ever assaulted or suffered at their hands, but that was common at the time. Now, after letters home, Lady Margaret interceded, contacting the royal court, and Flora MacDonald was allowed to live outside the tower, under strict supervision. Some documents say she raised vegetables in the grounds, others that she treated prisoners' wounds. And in June 1747, the court declared an act of indemnity and Flora and MacDonald of Kingsborough were released. Many believe that this act only came about because a number of high-profile names began raising money to buy her out of there. Numerous aristocratic sympathisers raised almost £1,580, which was approximately two to three million pounds back then. The one who had pledged most of it was Frederick, Prince of Wales, 
who was heir to the throne. He'd met and liked Flora MacDonald. He'd met her on numerous occasions and thought, and wrote down, that she was a decent lady with manners in keeping with a royal court. Now, the clincher may well have been when she explained her actions to him. I helped the man out of simple Presbyterian Christian charity. If you ever found yourself in his situation, I would have done the very same thing for you. After she was freed, she returned home, where a few years later, aged 28, she met and married Alan MacDonald, a captain in the British Army in November 1750. This seemed most peculiar to wed someone in the very army who had had you incarcerated. However, Alan MacDonald was in fact the eldest son of MacDonald of Kingsborough, and Flora had all but grown up with them. They first lived at Flodigarry on the Isle of Skye, inheriting the hall when Kingsborough died. And the writer, Samuel Johnson, visited the island on a couple of occasions and met with Flora MacDonald in 1773. He wrote, She is a woman of soft features, gentle manners, and an elegant presence. Later, he would be asked to write the inscription on her memorial stone at Kilmuir. It reads, a fine name that will be mentioned in history, and if courage and fidelity be virtues, mentioned with honour. Now, Alan MacDonald was lucky to have survived the bloody Seven Year War, where he'd often fought hand to hand in some very brutal and bloody battles. He served with the 114th and 62nd Regiment of Foot, and on one occasion found himself thrown over a cliff into the sea missing razor-sharp rocks by inches. Flora at home panicking until one of his letters arrived. Now, Alan was a fine soldier, but he really couldn't handle his money well. Instead of leaving the army a wealthy man, like most officers did, due to gambling and investing in failing businesses, he went back to Flora with pretty much nothing. He wasn't even a good administrator, spending much of his time arguing with clan chiefs and tenants about their rent. Flora knew this, and felt that she had to get him out of the pressure bubble that he seemed to be stuck in. So, on hearing of boats travelling to the New World and being given areas of land to farm, she thought it would be perfect for her dissatisfied husband. He and Flora cashed in all of their assets and emigrated to Anson County in North Carolina. And before long, Alan had built a fine farmstead called Killer Gray near the picturesque Mountain Creek. Here he discovered he wasn't a great farmer, but he delegated that type of work to his men. Sadly, Flora could still see that her man was still utterly unfulfilled. So in 1775, she was almost glad that the War of Independence had begun. Her Allen was back in uniform again, raising the Anson Battalion of the North Carolina Militia. He had gathered over a thousand men, including their two sons, Alexander and James. And they fought many a battle. Flora, at home, had to escape attacks by Indians fighting for the Americans. On two occasions, the homestead was burned, but she managed always to rebuild. In March 1775, her best friend and her family were massacred by Micmac and Maliseet Indians, looking for a way to prove to the Americans that they were loyal to them. The women were hung upside down, their faces in a campfire, and the men were spread-eagled on the ground with a fire lit between their legs. Flora must have seen far more than she ever admitted, trapped with this war exploding all around her. Then, en route to the coast to meet British transport ships, Allen's militia was savagely attacked by the Americans with their Indian allies. This would be known as the Battle of Moor Creek Bridge, and it happened on the 28th of February in 1776. He was captured early in the battle, and had to sit back and watch as most of his men were butchered, scalped, tortured, and the dead and wounded placed in a fire pit and burned. 
MacDonald was questioned by the American officers and they held him in a prison camp until the war was over. In April 1777, the North Carolina Provincial Government Congress decided to punish all of the landowners who had fought against them, so they confiscated Flora's homestead, Killigree, and that of all of their friends who had also been loyalist sympathisers. And Flora lost everything she owned. She was working in town doing anything she could to feed herself, living in the back room of a boarding house. Others say it was a boardy house. After he had served 18 months for sedition, her husband Alan was finally freed. And to bring money in for his wife who had said, had gone through hell because of me. Desperate for cash, he joined the American army. He was given back his rank and posted to Fort Edward, Nova Scotia, as commander of the regiment of foot. It took Flora almost 15 months to raise enough money to join him, but his money had allowed her to stop doing the less savoury jobs she had been forced to do. And by August 1778, they were finally living together back at the fort. Once again, less idyllic than you would think, there were a number of attacks by Native Americans, children stolen from the fort, and a number of outlaws that plagued the people living there. Once more, Flora just dealt with it, barely speaking about the awful things that she had witnessed. Yet whilst at Fort Edward, three families travelling there in coaches froze to death 400 yards from the fort gates. Children as young as 16 months old, frozen stiff. The medics and the ladies of Fort Edward were charged with recovering the bodies. So Flora would almost certainly have been involved. And maybe that was the last straw, for she admitted to friends that the tough winters that Nova Scotia suffered, especially the one in 1779, was making her yearn for home. Not New Scotland, Nova Scotia, but the real one. Alan couldn't, or maybe wouldn't, leave the army, citing it was his life and that he had too much still to do. So Flora travelled back home alone, taking passage on the good ship Dunmore, travelling to London. And even on board that ship, in heavy seas that cost three hands their lives, Flora was thrown across the room and her arm broken. Some say she fought a man who sought to rape her. But on arrival in London, she was suffering an infection and the arm had not healed as it should, so her return to Scotland was delayed. It took until spring of 1780 when finally her arm was okay. She could get back north and gaze across those gorgeous islands again. Her family seat was now occupied, so Flora had to stay with family until finally finding a suitable home at Penduin. Alan, waiting until all the work on the house was done, eventually returned to Flora, and she died in 1790 at the age of 68, which is a good age for people in those times. And I bet she'd seen far more adventures than most. She was buried in the Kilmuir Cemetery on the Isle of Skye. Her husband, Alan, died two years later. They had seven surviving children, two daughters and five sons. Two of the boys were lost at sea, one on a privateer, believed to be a pirate, the other on board a British naval ship. The third of the McDonald's, travelled the world over, concentrating on trading businesses in India, and they built up a massive fortune. So at least Flora and Alan in their latter years could have a comfortable retirement. Alex Shand, a friend of the family, said that Flora had told him dozens of times. Every time I would meet someone new, they would ask about Bonnie Prince Charlie. That was a few rather dull days early in my life. In fact, it was the very least of what I experienced. The cemetery at Kilmuir is said to be haunted by the spirit of Flora MacDonald. You often see her scanning the sea in all directions on regular occasions. And a bronze statue of Flora was built and placed in Inverness Castle in 1896. 
As are weather changes and we head towards spring, summer, whatever the warm bit's called these days, let's talk about a sunshine island, Bermuda. Every few years, the heaven that is Bermuda suffers a storm of immense force. And back in 2003, not that long ago, Hurricane Fabian arrived and it was classed as a Category 3. Low numbers like that make it sound as if it wasn't too bad, yet in reality, there were gusting winds at 125 miles an hour. Trees were torn out by their roots, roofs torn off homes, four people were swept off the causeway to their death, and thousands were left without electricity for days. We hear these stories often on our news, but because we're not there, we think of other things. But Bermuda, unlike the Caribbean islands to the south, is isolated. It's completely on its own, and it gets regular hurricane alerts. Yet I'm going to take you back in history for a surprise hurricane that settled a dispute that could have led to almost a civil war on the island. Now, very early in America's War of Independence, George Washington, who was then just a general, was fighting to free America from the colonial rule of the British. And he heard that in Bermuda, the British had a huge powder magazine on St. George's North Shore. So he decided to plan to sail down and steal it, because it was worth a fortune back in the day. Many Bermudans wanted their freedom from British rule too, so they had tipped Washington off about the gunpowder, yet most on the island were to keep in with the British. They wanted to stay loyal. So two different groups were at odds. It could so easily have become a part of the War of Independence. Now, long before Washington could get his men down to Bermuda to steal the gunpowder, a group of pro-British Bermudans had requisitioned three whaleboats and they'd made a secret landing in Tobacco Bay. The men guarding the gunpowder belonged to a local grower called Cabot who hated British rule and he wanted Washington to get the powder. Well, the Bermudans eased tails off the roof of the magazine and slid inside to get the barreled gunpowder ready to be moved. And just then, they were surprised by a uniformed guard who was just about to shoot when one of the burglars wedged a sharp tail into his throat. He fell to the floor, gasping for breath, blood bubbling from the slit as he finally drowned in his own blood. Rather than make it look as as if common thieves had murdered a man to steal the powder, they dragged his body out and buried it on the land of Babuna's governor, George James Brewer, who was a self-centred, arrogant and brutal man who had also wanted rid of British rule. On one occasion, he told a group of Bermudan dignitaries that if I were made king of Bermuda and the British put to flight, I would double your annual profit at a stroke. And that sort of line may have worked if coming from a politician with any degree of morality Yet coming from him, it sounded like wind and piss. So just over a hundred barrels of gunpowder were rolled down the hill into the boats and they vanished into the darkness. The governor was white with rage, demanding the heads of any Bermudan involved in such a crime. Even so, the powder found its way into the hands of George Washington eventually. Exactly what Brewer really wanted but he was the British governor, so he had to maintain this two-faced outrage as they were making him rich. It was at this point that a group of rebels thought it was time that they'd begin rallying Bermudans against the British rule. Now, many people had great sympathy for the American cause of freedom, for they too had been colonized by a superpower, a superpower in its day. Yet they simply didn't have enough men to take on those loyal to King George III. It's interesting that a hundred years after the gunpowder theft, the body of the murdered man was exhumed and they discovered he was a French officer. It may well have 
been that Bruyer was dealing with enemies of the British. He really did play for all sides. Yet from the outside, everybody believed him to be totally loyal to the Crown. In fact, in what is currently the post office on the island, he kept American prisoners in the very worst condition. No wounds were ever treated, so the stink of rotten, gangrenous flesh, decay, and the sweetness of people dying filled the rooms. There were cells enough for 20, yet they had 190 men in there at any time, living right next to the dying. They provided enough food for 10 men per day, so death, disease and misery was inevitable. On one occasion, a priest from Scotland visited the cells and wrote, I've visited hell today, and it can be found in Bermuda. The island is the most beautiful place on earth that I have seen, and yet in those dark cells, I saw the black heart of humanity. As I walked through buildings, in one cell a man had just died, and there before me, I saw around 15 prisoners tearing the dead body apart and eating it, uncooked innards being chewed, so those poor broken bodies could get water from the corpse. Each man so desperate to stay alive, they would endure this vile indignity. What was so much worse was seeing the eyes of the men in other cells, so jealous that one of their number had not perished, so that they could do the same. I asked if I could give these men water and was abruptly told, don't waste it. I never thought that I would ever see something that would prove to me that under certain conditions we humans can become as wild and vicious as any animal. There was rebellion in the air though. Something was stirring and many believed that there was the inevitability of a civil war about to break out. And then nature intervened and a massive hurricane began to roll in from the east. The rain was pounding, already the palm trees folding over and being torn away. Yet plans had been made to start trouble that night, and the rebels thought, well, perhaps the weather would help them. So that morning, each area leader headed to Hamilton. In total, about 11 from St George's, Smith's, Devonshire, Pembroke, Paget, Warwick, Southampton and Sandys. Each one had a dozen men with him, armed to the teeth, in readiness to attack government buildings, castles, forts, harbours. The plan was to meet, decide on targets and then later that same day, so no one could inform on them, they would begin their attacks. Now with the weather as fierce as it was, had the attacks gone ahead, there was a very good chance that Bermuda could have found themselves with an independent land. Yet it seems that the weather was firmly on the side of the crown. The rebel leaders had discussed their strategy. They were ready, so they were just about to leave their hideaway, a building very close to Shelley Bay. The hurricane was now on the island and turning huge homes into matchwood. It was a vicious, violent thing, hurling boats out of the sea over the island, crashing into homes, crashing into people, moving rocks and stones that had been excavated to widen the nearby causeway and took away and turning them into deadly missiles. People throughout the centuries have spoken about how vital it has been to be in the right place at the right time, yet there is equal necessity never to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. The rebel leaders were battling against a wind that stole your breath, but they were pumped up with adrenaline and ready for their great moment in history. Now, Edward Gallagher was the rebel leader from Warwick and wrote about what happened next actively changing the future for Bermuda. He wrote, It was two in the afternoon, yet as black as midnight. As we stepped out of the house, we could barely see with rain horizontally hitting us in the face, mixed with sand and soil, and small stones fired so hard at us that it cut our faces. There ahead of us stood a twisting, coiling tornado, and we were afeared that it would change direction and move towards us. 
Yet after we stood a while, we saw it move across the land and into the sea, and it was then that our leader, John Rawls, told us to make our way to our men, and at nine that night we attack. We approached the narrow causeway and could not believe how powerful the wind was. It blew a whole house over our heads that belonged to Miss Pevensey, and I swear I could see her in it as it fell to pieces in the sea. We could not believe what was happening. The tornado had turned and was now in Tucker Bay and stood a hundred feet from us, knocking us off our feet. We knew we had to get across the causeway and we began scrambling our way from the beast that roared at us. We were in the middle of it when I saw clearly what had happened. Piled up on a nearby dock, huge stones in readiness to extend and bolster this thin causeway. There was a sound like Satan howling and I saw literally hundreds of them just explode and they fired across the causeway ten times faster than a cannonball. I led the group and had slipped down into a pothole and on seeing the stones coming instantly lay as flat as I could staring at my compatriots following me. I shouted to them but could not be heard with such a vociferous fury that I remained unheard. And that very second, I watched as at least four of their skulls just exploded. Then our leader, John Rawls, was hit so hard that his head and shoulders were torn off and flew past me. I was crying, for they had been my dearest of friends, and I remember lying there for what seemed to be hours. And then, as the noise began to turn from roar to the relative calm of strong wind and rain, I climbed up and I was alone on the promontory. There was blood everywhere, a pair of human legs wedged between the huge stones. I was the only of the rebels to survive. History knows not of us, yet had that storm never happened, we would have been the kings of the island of Bermuda. And when you're walking along the silent, pure, white, sandy beaches, it's hard to believe that they ever had any other weather than absolute total sun. Yet along that causeway near Tucker Bay, there have been strange sightings of spirit in the early evening, shadowy images of human beings torn to pieces by the force of nature. It's amazing, but on numerous occasions, Somebody would have rang me doing a talk show on the radio and told me a story. And then I go back and I research the story and I'll find the root of it. And that's what happened about a tiny small village called Harperley. Now you can find this in County Durham between Tan Toby and Tanfield Lee. And it brings us a wonderful mystery from the 1960s. In May 1963, a circus visited the village and was persuaded to sell a few of its creatures to the local zoo. The circus was shrinking. A handful of basic rides, swings, and a handful of acts that had all frankly seen better days. And when the circus left town, there was no sign of a local woman called Mary Bloom or Brown uh, another version says Broom we think it was Bloom she'd been living with a local window cleaner called Mickey Flynn he'd been a, a brute towards her, blacking her eye regularly or giving her a bloody nose she had no family locally because she'd moved down to Stanley for work from her original home in Fort William, Scotland so her friends told her to leave him even if it meant losing a job and having to return home to Scotland when nothing, anything, was better than taking a daily beating off a drunken slob. Eventually, Flynn's slapdash window cleaning round ran out of customers. A better window cleaner had arrived, and Flynn took it out on Mary, giving her a hiding, breaking her ribs, breaking her jaw, and on one occasion, breaking her arm on purpose, putting it on a doorstep and stamping on it, Finally, the penny dropped. That Friday, she was gathering her belongings and she was off. 
This made Flynn even angrier, yet he seemed to accept it with an alarming calmness. For the next three days, he was almost amicable. He even helped her gather her clothes and personal effects. The leaving coincided with the final night of the circus, and it then packed up in readiness to leave early Saturday morning. So Saturday arrived. Mary's friends were wondering where she was. They had spoken to her on Friday lunchtime when she was in her grey dressing gown, putting the last of her things in a wooden tea chest. She said she would bring them to Karen, her best friend, spend the night with her and then catch a train home from Newcastle in the morning. The ticket was bought, everything sorted, and Flynn was very compliant. But she just didn't show up. Karen and two friends visited Flynn, who said that she'd left and good riddance to her. She even pushed her way into their house and there was no sign of her or any of her things. Flynn said, I bet she's run off with a fancy man from the circus. Now, her best friend had no idea what he was talking about. She'd never been to the circus, so how could she have met someone? Yet Flynn was acting like a boyfriend who had been cheated on. Don't you bitches come back here. Leave me alone. And frankly, they were happy to oblige. Karen tried to locate the circus, but it had appeared in Carlisle for a week and then was off on a brief Irish tour. Mary was gone and seemingly impossible to find. Then one of the girls saw Flynn in his little square back garden burning some rubbish and in particular bits of a tea chest. Now, you never scrapped a tea chest. You never knew when they were going to be handy and these things were commonly used when folk moved house in the 1960s. Yet she couldn't possibly say it was Mary's for sure. But she told Karen later that night and with a torch they scanned the ashes and found a little piece of bright patterned fabric like a dress their friend had once had. However, if she had left stuff, he was entitled to get shot of them, but still not a message, not a letter, not a word from a girl who had suffered so much, and these were close friends of hers. Over the next few months, people near a bridge nearby began seeing a ghostly figure moving across the bridge and then disappearing into the tree lane. The local postman, Harry Rogers, said, oh, I see her most mornings around 6.30am. She looks like she's just got up. She's wearing a long robe, totally grey and quite pretty, but she looks really sad. Now, the local press even took up the story in the 60s, telling everybody in a local newspaper how haunted the site was. In the next few days, dozens of locals from Catchgate, New Cayo, West Cayo, Anfield Plain and Stanley all came forward, saying that they had all seen the same entity too, wearing a long flowing gown. She was called the Harperly Grey Lady. The following June, Karen and her new boyfriend, Dennis, decided to have a picnic by Cayo Burn on a beautiful summer's day. They'd kissed a bit, had a pie and a sandwich, even finished off a bottle of wine between them. And as evening began to descend, the temperature beginning to drop, and they began packing up. They packed up their Austin car with the remaining food, drink, picnic basket, and taking all their rubbish with them. And at that moment, Karen spotted something near the bridge. It was a figure, yet in the darkness it seemed almost to be glowing. She screamed a little, and Dennis came running, and it was obvious that he could see it too. And they both dived into the small car, and he revved up the engine. And then he realised that the only way home was actually through the figure, standing now on the end of the bridge. Their blood flowed like ice. They were petrified. He just put his foot down and hoped for the best. As the car neared the figure, Karen yelled, Stop! 
The Austin screeched to a halt and half slid on the gravel road. Mary! shouted Karen. Is that you, Mary? The figure stared at both of them from less than ten yards away. The figure wore a dressing gown identical to Mary's. The face was blackened, but Karen could tell it was her friend. Who did this to you? Wasn't that sod Flynn? The figure appeared to nod and then evaporated. They both saw it clearly and then went to the local police station, which was then in Stanley. The police sergeant obviously didn't believe either of them, yet an investigation took place and cadaver dogs visited the bridge site and found nothing untoward. So Mary never left with the circus. Did her vicious ex murder her on the night she was due to leave? Nothing was ever proven. Flynn held to his story, using Karen as a witness that she had left the house with her stuff and the police were powerless to proceed. Yet in 1968, a human finger was found in the Cayo Burn. Maybe he buried her in the bottom of the stream under that bridge. It's a place where no one has ever looked. Mary's spirit in her dressing gown is still often seen by locals. The most recent, a caller to my show in September 2017. Will she ever be found to free that poor disembodied spirit from patrolling the scene of her death forever? Well, we'll never know. But we hope that you've enjoyed our Grizzly Tales podcast. And if you did, please spread the word. Thank you so much to the people that go and enjoy the various things that's available for you on robsonsworld.com. Makes a huge difference to me, and I thank you kindly for it. Spread the word. There are literally hundreds of adventures there shared across the world and I hope you'll tell others to join the four come and check it out enjoy the photographs too and everything else that's there waiting for you but until we are back together again from me Alan Robson thank you again and until next time stay well and I wish you well Thank you.